with and at the request of the Kayuk and the Yurok tribes of California. Uh, this project was jointly incepted out of an extant official collaboration between UC Berkeley and both tribes, the aim of which was ultimately to put our heads together and utilize all of the tools at our, um, at, in our toolboxes, both from an academic and a research perspective, as well as from a tribal practitioner and government perspective in support of the ecosystems of the Klamath River, um, as well as in support of uh, cultural sustainability and uh, restoration. So the questions that I was tasked with, uh, with investigating uh, surround these effects of seasonal prescribed fire on tan oak acorn abundance and infestation, Tanok acorns are one of the most important cultural resources, terrestrial plant resources, to the Kayuk and the Yurok people. Um, they are both a ceremonial and an everyday foodstuff. As well, I was tasked with investigating factors, both biological, abiotic, and sociological, surrounding the availability and abundance of Tanok acorns within tribal communities. Out of this was born then the question uh, as to whether or not we, uh, what can we do potentially to increase access uh, to cultural burning practices by tribal communities in support of cultural resources given the current environmental and political conditions of our day and in our state. A little bit on tan oak, uh, Novolithocarpus densiflorus, recently classified from lithocarpus. It is the only lonesome species in its genus. Uh, it's extremely closely related to other North American oaks. It's evergreen when pollinated. Uh, acorns mature in two years, which in reality means about 18 months, and will play very strongly into the presentation towards the end. It's a facultative cedar. Uh, acorns germinate and sprout quite vigorously. Tanics can also re-sprout post-disturbance from extant underground root systems. Uh, mature trees can certainly withstand low to mid-severity fire. Historically, uh, tanic acorn groves or orchards were burned in the fall um, and this burn was targeted uh, to coincide with uh, the trough in the bimodal abscission pattern of tan oak acorns. Typically a tree will shed acorns that are either infested or are maturing improperly earlier in the season while retaining acorns that are proceeding normally until later in the season. So there is a marked dip in acorn abscission and culturally fire was targeted at that dip to reduce uh, larval populations that infest the acorns as well as to facilitate collection. It's much easier to collect tan acorn acorns on a charred black ground. Fire and tan oaks, as I said, are extremely interrelated. Um, this is a quote from a gentleman by the name of Klamath River Jack in a letter to the California Bureau of Fish and Game in 1916 during an era where fire suppression was extremely strong, trying to explain Native Californian perspective on why it was so important to maintain fire, at least within these tannic uh, orchards. I haven't yet discovered a person or a way to say this better than this quote, so I offer it to you. A little bit on the lower and the mid Klamath watershed. It's an exquisite location. I don't know if any of you have been there. If you haven't, please, if you get an opportunity, go. For those of you who have been, you know what I'm talking about. It is the ancestral territory of both the Kayuk and the Yurok people, and they still do live in place, which is unique among Native American communities in this country. Uh, it's a biodiversity hotspot. It's one of the four most diverse conifer forests in the world, with a record 17 species of conifers being recorded within a square mile. Um, in addition to the sizable number of endemic and relic plant populations within the Klamath Mountains, uh, plant assemblages hail from 
a combination of species from the Coast Range, the Cascades, and the Sierra Nevadas, all which converge within the climate bioregion to create these magical, <laughs> unique assemblages of plants who, uh, that hail from the different floras of those mountains. Um, it is an extremely pyrodiverse landscape. Uh, this is topographically controlled, it's controlled by the variety of habitats, it's also controlled by a very pronounced moisture gradient from west to east uh, between the coast and the Shasta Plateau. The primary uh, infester of acorns are the larvae of the filbert worm and the filbert weevil. Uh, as the common names imply, these are common agricultural pests and they are found throughout the United States as well. Once the seed coat has been breached by an opposition event, typically one can see uh, secondary infestation by powdery and filamentous fungi as well. So there is a common co-occurrence between the two types of infestation. Our research sites were developed uh, on six areas within the ancestral territory of the Cayuga Yurok people uh, on private land and tribal reservation land where available. All sites bear historical signs of management and tending activities. Uh, and the bread and butter of our sampling design were split plot two by one meter uh, exclosure cages made of rebar, hardware cloth, and uh, hex mesh to, uh, to deter herbivory, but as well to allow fire to pass through relatively unimpeded as well as acorns to drop in. In addition, this year we set up uncaged plots under the perimeter of uh, the Tanoka can canopy at uh, one in conjunction with each of the cages that we already have. Uh, at each site there are approximately 10 to 30 plots per site that's dependent on the number of tanoka trees available. We set up one cage per tree and uh, scattered between control and treatment sites we have 118 plots. Those control plots uh, exist as unburned areas within the burn perimeter as well as dedicated control sites that have not seen fire anywhere close to them. Um, because we were unable to achieve proper permits for uh, fall fire for the duration of the time that we have been working, we chose to modify our questions to ask what the effects on these cultural resources were given the currently available fire uh, prescriptions of today, and that meant spring, at least up in, in NorCal. Uh, so we collected our acorns at three time points, roughly coinciding with early, middle, and late acorn drop and collected a variety of different data types. This is just uh, an example. There are many more covering uh, acorn production and infestation, as well as stand level characteristics, and data that documents the fire as well. So here are preliminary infestation analyses. These, uh, these box and whisker plots that describe the percentage of total tanoric acorns infested by treatment category. That's a little hard to see. Um, so here we have the 2013 acorns, which were collected approximately six months after the treatment was engaged in. As you can see, there is a, a pronounced difference in the median uh, of the percentage of infested acorns, as well as a significant difference in the sample means, uh, with the treatment uh, infestation rates being significantly lower uh, than the untreated controls. 2014 was one year post-fire, which, according to tribal <coughs> practitioners, should also register as treatment signature. However, as you can see, uh, not only are infestation rates exceptionally high, but there is no difference either in median or mean between the two samples. This was a big head-scratcher for us, so we decided to see what we could discover about why this might be happening. One of the areas that we looked at was total acorn production. Uh, so in this graph, or in this box and whisker plot, of total acorn production, both for 2013 and 2014, you can see that uh, average production is way up uh, in 2013, as an, an nigh on zero for the 2014 plots. Why might this be happening? Um, a couple of reasons. One of which could be that tan oaks uh, naturally follow boom-bust production patterns similar to the masting patterns of oak trees. Uh, masting patterns in oaks have been, uh, have been described. They have not officially been described for Novolithocarpus. Uh, so this would beg further, uh, further investigation and a continued monitoring of these plots to try to get more long-term data on this. 
as well, uh, it has been documented that there is a negative effect of water deficit on uh, Quercus acorn production, uh, which as well might be true as for Nova Lithocarpus, but again, this has not been explicitly described. Uh, I have the average, uh, the annual precipitation and temperature data for 2012 and 2013. 2012 conditions would have affected the acorn production of 2013 as well. Uh, conditions in 2013 would affect production in 2014 given that they are two year acorns. As you can see in 2013, the average annual precipitation is a small fraction of what the average is from 1904 to 2014. As well, uh, 2013 was the third driest year on record uh, from 1904, from the beginning of this data set. So how might this have affected infestation rates? Well, uh, predator populations or frugivore populations based on an increased resource availability would be then be affecting uh, a very much depauperate uh, acorn population in 2014, which might explain why we get these elevated signatures of, of infestation that are so strong that they cancel out any of our treatment signatures. So essentially, drought plus average larval, larval population equals lots and lots of infestation. This is how I think. So, <laughs> um, In conclusion, first and foremost, uh, there is a reduction in infestation rates following the spring prescribed fire, which is great news for acorns as well as cultural practitioners. Uh, if a culture is based upon the material, is in part based upon the material resources that it, that helps support it, then it's extremely important for cultural continuity to have continued access to these resources. We also think that it's very important to continue, continue to monitor the relationships between acorn production and drought, given potential climate change scenarios in the future, as well as to monitor the interactions or the combined interactions of frugivore populations on those cultural resources as well. And one of the uh, sort of one of the ex unexpected but extremely important facets that this data sort of inspired was the real need to consider the availability of cultural resources in the context of larger scale climate patterns, uh, which we have no idea what they will look like. In the, at least what the cultural resources will look like in the future. So we try to have as much fun as we possibly can while we're working, and I think we do a pretty good job. Um, and as I said, uh, really there should be a cadre of teachers and advisors here beside me who <coughs> have guided and supported me. Uh, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. The giants on whose shoulders I stand are giant indeed. So thank you guys very much for your time.